It has been documented and portrayed in films and information circles for around 200 years that a group of people control the world's money, real estate, resources, energy, food, control the world's stock market, but above all, control the world's supply of gold. Many groups have been called out, but one household name that stands out than many others is the Illuminati. And it is said that the Illuminati is a small group of wealthy people sat around a table making the decisions for the world in a shadow world government. They have created big centers of commerce and finance to bankroll their fortunes which they hide. But in all fairness, is there any evidence to back this up? And who made the, these first claims that families like the Rothschilds, who have vast estates, who are major players in the financial system and helped to set up Israel and are part of the Illuminati, the all-seeing eye who have control over the rest of the world's people? Or is it just paranoia which was built out of the suburbs of isolation and has existed in America since the first settlers came over to America, which has led to many other conspiracy theories in the history of the USA. So history can easily be distorted in this century of the corporate conglomerates taking more power and it's obvious to see there is a huge gap between the corporations owned by the wealthy and the poor. And as the wealthy betray their lavish lifestyles, where did this fear or information that one group, the Illuminati, control everything come from? It's plain to see humans have predictable patterns, are easily manipulated into believing anything, but ingrained into the very fabric of society is this fear. And it wasn't until one night when Kerry Forney and Greg Hill were discussing many outlandish ideas, conspiracy theories and realities at a bowling alley. Forney proposed the universe as a fixed order and Hill said it is born out of chaos and it was human thought that projected the order onto the chaos. Young friend of mine and I uh, back in, uh, well I say young, he was just a couple years younger than I was back in the 50s were uh, sitting around in a bowling alley in 1958 to be exact, somewhere in the vicinity of Whittier, California. Uh, and we were uh, discussing uh, philosophy and we were talking about order and chaos. And uh, my theory was a Darwinistic theory that uh, order uh, emerged from chaos uh, and was in fact simply the prevailing form of chaos. And uh, Greg's theory was that order was projected on the universe, that it didn't exist at all, that it was a creation of the human mind that order was entirely in perception and had nothing to do with what was going on out there in a completely chaotic universe. Thornley was inspired by this, so he and Greg Hill decided to set up a movement dedicated to the idea of chaos. They called it Discordianism. Underlying it all was the belief that the individual had the power inside themselves to bring order and meaning to the chaos, not the old systems of power that created the fears and suspicion. Then a set of strange coincidences happened which was going to lead Thornley down a long dark rabbit hole. Thornley was sent to the Marines to do service for his country and at the camp he befriended and became inspired by an individual who embodied this individualism because he refused to bow down to the power of his officers in charge. His name was Lee Harvey Oswald. Somewhere in his time spent at the Marines, Thornley started to write a novel with Oswald as the main figure. But then suddenly this hero of the New Age defected to the enemy, the Soviet Union, and all of a sudden, strangely, this character came out of the novel and into true reality. I don't know what the situation was. I don't know.
So uh, it was really uh, a weird experience for me because I was writing this novel uh, based on Oswald. When Oswald defected to the Soviet Union, I decided to write a novel about a Marine who becomes disenchanted with the U.S. and goes to the Soviet Union. And so it was like the hero, and I didn't like Kennedy. I was extremely anti-Kennedy myself because I was so much into Ayn Rand, the laissez-faire capitalism, objectivism, and Kennedy was the arch villain of, of, our, uh, of our movement at that time. And uh, it was like the hero of my novel jumped up off the pages of my book and shot the president. And it was, it was, it, it was very weird. Kerry Thornley had left the army and LA for New Orleans where he would work in a bar and ingrain himself in the local anarchist movements. The movement Discordianism, which he and Greg had started, was starting to grow, spreading by word of mouth and across many counterculture parties, festivals, music events and movements popping up, as they all seemed to be against the government, distrusting all the old systems of power and both sides of the coin, the left and the right. Thornley also published his then manuscript in 1962 and eventually novel in 1991 with Lee Harvey Oswald as the main figure named the Idle Warriors. Not only had Thornley been in the Marines, but he had also lived in the same area as Lee Harvey Oswald before the assassination of JFK, which had brought him to the attention of the main person who created the JFK official narrative, Jim Garrison, who was the district attorney of New Orleans in 1967. I said three things, essentially. I said that it was apparent that the Central Intelligence Agency was extensively engaged in domestic espionage. I said, secondly, that it was apparent that the CIA was in the murder business. And I said, third, that it was also apparent that a part of the CIA was involved in the murder of President Kennedy. Now, in the last year, the CIA has admitted being extensively involved in domestic espionage. And they've been admitted being in, involved in the murder Central America. Latin America worked closely with the CIA, so New Orleans was an important city for the CIA. We found, as we dug into Lee Oswald's background in New Orleans, everybody connected with him, we found, ultimately, that nobody was associated with Lee Oswald who was not one way or the other connected with, with, with the intelligence structure, whether it was a um, contract employee of the CIA like Dave Ferry, or Clay Shaw, as we know from Victor Marchetti, who brought that out last year, Richard Helms' former assistant, but uh, all the way down to the part-time employees, the, Cube, the anti-Castro adventurers who were employed by the Central Intelligence Agency. So it was a case of our having bumped into so many, one after the other, that this very group of people, as we began to look at them after a year, and and put them in perspective with regard to their function, we began to realize we were dealing with the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, I might answer it this way, with regard to the novel that we're talking about, uh, The Star-Spangled Contract, even though that's fiction and it's not a JFK scenario. Nevertheless, it, while I hope to entertain the reader, at the same time, I am trying to give him insights with regard to the reality of our intelligence community and what it's doing to this country. When Garrison read Kerry Thornley's novel, he linked up all the people together and found a pattern. He accused the CIA, Big Business, the Cubans, Oswald and Thornley all of conspiracy and being involved. This infuriated Thornley as there was no evidence linking him to the killing of JFK. But not only did he discover a pattern of false information, he had also a great belief that conspiracy theories not only control the individual but society as a whole as it gives people the feelings of being powerless and having to prove your theories and information which always sound outlandish. So there, there are ways of deconditioning people. Uh, and uh, this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in finding some technique by which great masses of people can be uh, broken out of their authoritarian conditioning all at once, figure out exactly what that type of enlightenment is, that type of liberation from authoritarian conditioning is, and how to achieve it. 
uh, on a wholesale basis. You then had the CIA in the 1950s until the 1990s funding experiments such as MKUltra led by Dr. Donald Cameron in the Montreal Hospital leading strange mind control experiments on humans to try and delete certain people's memories. This is what led Thornley, who knew people working at Playboy magazine, to use Playboy as an experiment to show people how ridiculous most conspiracy theories are and how easy it is to fool people. He called it Operation Mindfuck. In 1967, he and Greg Hill began the operation by placing the first of a number of false conspiracies in between two other ads in a magazine, the first being about some penises and guns and the second being about a man's testicles from heavy petting. Formley's fake story was wedged in between and the question was, was all political assassinations being masterminded by a secret hidden society called the Illuminati? It said that the Illuminati was the cause of all the world's problems, wars, famine and many other claims in history. He and the other Discordians then began to spread this false information all across America through the counterculture, books, magazines, TV, music and then this spread around the world into a massive culture. Formley's aim was to spread such stupid information that people would see the absurdity of believing then and he purposely chose the Illuminati for the experiment because he would believe that no one would believe an 18th century Illuminati from Bavaria defunct and then a very small order could be the secret leaders of a 20th century world. This operation worked in the 60s, 70s and 80s but with the advent of the internet people's lack of real research and the KGBs and CIA false information still spreading around the world and poisoning the next generations coming up there is a growing number of people still spreading profiteering from and regurgitating this information which was false back in the 1960s on purpose I wound up dismissing it as a coincidence until 1975 uh, in the meantime, though, more coincidences had accumulated. I had met Guy Bannister, uh, a figure, a suspect in the garrison probe. I had met Clay Shaw two weeks before the assassination, and a, a discussion of my book about Oswald, the Idol Warriors, was involved. And I had met David Ferry, and I had met uh, a number of other uh, of garrison suspects, uh, a Stringer for Life magazine named Dave Chandler. I had even worked in a, in a restaurant where Oswald had lived in his youth uh, with his mother. Uh, so uh, there were co meaningful coincidences and meaningless coincidences, but there were just enormous numbers of coincidences. And a lot of them were pointed out to me by Jim Garrison's assistants and by Jim Garrison himself when he came after me in 1969, accusing me of, or actually 1968 and 69, accusing me of being a CIA agent and so on and so forth and being involved in the assassination. At that time, I didn't think I was, but I could not explain all these weird coincidences. Whilst the CIA was spreading false information around the USA trying to cover up their involvement in the JFK assassination, they were also trying to create a new way to manage such events in the future where information doesn't spread out to the mainstream media before the government or ruling class get their spin on the narrative first. There was also Thornley's misinformation spreading around which was starting to be believed by people all around the USA and then later on the internet around the world. It began to make sense because he knew all these different things. He, he, he knew I was going to Mexico that summer. Uh, I had planned to stay in Mexico for a month. I came back a little early before the month was over. Oswald was in Mexico City. Uh, he knew all that stuff, and so he could have arranged most of those coincidences. He could have arranged for me to meet Guy Bannister. He was probably working with Guy Bannister. He could have arranged for me to meet Clay Shaw and David Perry and so on and so forth, because they all were arranged meetings. It was almost like these people were going out of their way to shake hands with me, and that was pretty much it. Hmm. So it was very strange. It still seems very strange to me, although these days I feel like I understand a lot more about the assassination than I did then, of course. 
Now that the Illuminati has become a box office hit is talked about by many people, especially those in conspiratorial circles, you can clearly see that there was no evidence backing it up, only blogs, YouTube videos and a few books released after the 70s. What we do know is that most of these conspiracy theories were purposely spread by the Discordians or the CIA, which has later been embellished, regurgitated and changed along the way to suit the person speaking at the time. Generation after generation spreading this false information and and every time something major happens in the world, the small minority of conspiracy theorists will bring out the Illuminati cards, which were very popular game in the 1980s. Discordians also claimed as a prank that they paid for the Georgia Guidestones to be put up in the 1980s next to a quarry and free stonemason companies as another way to add to their original prank, the Operation Mindfuck. So what are the chances that the information you are spreading is just not nonsense that's been passed on from purposely spread conspiracy theories 50 years ago and then has been regurgitated, re-embellished and changed when the internet came along and messed about by the, the Russian KGB, the CIA and people just spreading information um, without actually having anything to back it up for the sake of it or because they are making uh, money from this 